this better? Much better. Wow. Well, that's a bit of feedback for me. I thought I could project. Okay. So I, I asked, if not you, who? And that's the motto for Advanced Care Planning Month, which is this April, 2023. And we're so pleased on behalf of Dying with Dignity Canada, the GTA chapter, we're so pleased to welcome all of you here in the theater and all of you on Zoom to this very special event in honor of advanced care planning. I'm Bina Feldman, I'm a volunteer with the GTA chapter of Dying with Dignity Canada. So what does that mean, if not you who? If you were unable to speak for yourself, who would speak for you in an emergency? Advanced care planning is the process of reflection and communication. It's a time for you to reflect on your values and wishes and let people know what kind of health and personal care you would want in the future if you were unable to speak for yourself. At Dying with Dignity Canada, we're so pleased that April 16th was dedicated to ACP Day and the whole month of April is Advanced Care Plan. And this is an opportunity for all of us to think about advanced care planning. It's not just for the old and sick, it's for everyone really. Each person should think about their values and wishes and who they would want to speak for them in the event that they couldn't speak for themselves. So I encourage all of you here today to be ambassadors for ACP and to tell your friends and your family that you want them to fill out an advanced care plan, which is easily found on the internet. We're lucky to have a very distinguished speaker here tonight, and before I tell you more about him, I want to take this opportunity to thank Roz Doctorow. Roz, stand up, let everyone see that there she is. Yes, weren't for your initiative, we wouldn't be here tonight, so we want to thank you for your initiative and uh, making this happen, and we want to thank the uh, Di Dying with Dignity head office for helping us bring forth this event. Dying with Dignity is a human rights charity. We're entirely funded by individual donations and all our resources and education are free. We appreciate any donations that allow us to continue our work in advocacy, education, and supporting suffering individuals and their families, caregivers, and healthcare providers. In keeping with Indigenous protocol and building respectful relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada, it is customary to acknowledge the traditional territories or ancestral lands of Indigenous peoples. The GTA chapter of Dying with Dignity Canada is working to ensure that our practice of acknowledgement recognizes the valuable traditions and experiences of the First Nations people upon whose land we are guests. From the lands of the Anishinaabe to the Adirondack, the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, these surrounding lands, surrounding the Great Lakes, are steeped in Indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we are in solidarity with Indigenous brothers and sisters to honour and respect the four directions, lands, plants, animals, and ancestors that walked before us, and all of the wonderful elements of creation that exist. A few housekeeping details before we get started. We're uh, started at 7, we'll be through by 8.30. I ask you now to please turn off your cell phones. We will take questions at the end of Dr. presentation, and they can be live from this audience or via Zoom, the chat function. There will be a signing of books as well as dying with dignity materials in the auditorium at the end of this talk. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Blair Bigham. Although I just met him tonight, 
I feel as if we're old friends. After reading his book, your personal style, your authenticity, your vulnerability really uh, stands out in this book, as I'm sure you've been told by many people. And um, I never thought a book about death would be easy reading, but for those of you who haven't read it, it certainly is. Dr. Bigham is an award-winning journalist, scientist, and physician who trained in emergency and critical care medicine at McMaster and Stanford Universities. He was a Global Journalism Fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Associate Scientist at St. Michael's Hospital. His work has appeared in newspapers, magazines, newscasts, podcasts, and journals. He is co-host of CMAJ Podcast and deputy editor at healthydebate.ca. He witnesses the relationship between wealth and health on a daily basis and reports on the undertold stories of patients, healthcare providers, and the systems that help or fail them. His first book, Death Interrupted, How Modern Medicine is Hating the Way We Die, became a national bestseller. And it's available in bookstores, online, and in our lobby, and he'll be signing those. So please help me welcome <laughs> Dr. Bigham. This is life. This is what I think about every day and every night. This molecule is adenosine triphosphate. It's the currency of your body. It's money. And if you run out of it, it's not going to end very well for you. Adenosine triphosphate is what gives every cell in your body energy. And when I see someone who's dying in the emergency department or the ICU, I ask myself, how do I help this body make adenosine triphosphate? I've been doing this for about 15 years, wondering how I can build up adenosine triphosphate, whether that's through my early career racing through the streets in ambulances, or now in the emergency department or the ICU. When a nurse calls me stat to the bedside, or when a code blue blares over the public announcement system in a hospital, and I'm running through the hall like they do on TV, my only question is, what happened to the adenosine triphosphate? You have about as much adenosine triphosphate in your body as the weight of an egg right now. But every day you use up 150 kilograms of adenosine triphosphate, which is about the weight of a reindeer. So how do you go from the weight of an egg to the weight of a reindeer in order to stay alive? Well, it's this. No, I won't be testing you on it. But this is the chemical reaction in your body, dependent on oxygen, that creates adenosine triphosphate. This is how many times this chemical reaction occurs in your body every 24 hours. And if it stops for even a few minutes, you're dead. I've seen a lot of people die as a paramedic and a physician. Some people die suddenly. They die unexpectedly. They literally drop dead. Some people die slowly. When they die slowly, they express a range of emotions, a range of beliefs, a range of thoughts. But no matter how you die, you tend to die without much control. And for a lot of people, that adds the burden of the dying process. It adds to grief. It adds to anxiety. The problem with this is that we're all going to die. It's the most predictable thing in your life right now. And yet, most of you aren't ready for it. I'm certainly not. And I wrote a book about it. <laughs> I might be the least prepared to die I've ever been. 
I'm terrified of not having enough adenosine triphosphate. But sooner or later, that time will come for me and it will come for all of you. And so let me ask you, when is the perfect time to die? If you could choose, when would that be? It's not an easy question to answer. Here's an easier one. When's the worst time to die? How do we choose? I'm sure we're all, oh my goodness, this way, that way, this way. The way my aunt died, the way my brother died, the way my mom died. Everybody has an idea of how they don't want to die. So push that further and ask yourself how you do want to die. Because now, a lot of people die like this. Is what I do every day I go to work. I put tubes and wires and lines into people. I send them to the operating room. I poke and prod them. I use technology to take over almost every single organ in their body. Their heart? I can affect heart rate. I can affect blood. I can affect whether or not your kidneys work. I can affect whether or not your stomach works. I can affect whether or not your lungs work. I can take over every single organ in your body except one, and that's your brain. For some people, they walk out of the hospital alive, and I know that I saved their life with this technology. That's why it exists. That's why I went to medical school. That's why we spend billions of dollars a year on healthcare and science and technology, because it works most of the time. And when it doesn't work, we're kind of stuck in the ICU, like this, going, now what? We applied the technology in good faith. We wanted it to work. We wanted to save your life. But we couldn't. And so we end up in this tug of war between two paradigms, resuscitate, keep going, Keep seeking that recovery, that cure, or palliate. Call it quits. As a doctor, I have failed. I cannot save your life. The technology is not working. It's time to turn it off. But there is so much tension in switching from resuscitate to palliate. And so it led me to this question. Is the technology meant to help us that was created and applied to humans in good faith complicating the way we die? To answer this question, I went back to the beginning. Not the very beginning, but I went back about 100 years. And I asked, well, how did we used to die before we had all of this technology? And the answer was simple. We just died. You got sick, people came and said, oh wow, you look sick. And then you would die and people would be like, yeah, they were sick, and that's what happens. We didn't have much to offer. There were doctors, but you know, they didn't have a lot of tools. Uh, you might argue they didn't have a lot of smarts back in the 1800s, you know, leeches and a number of other things that we don't really do anymore. But what they didn't have was the ability to make you breathe when your body couldn't breathe anymore, or to help your heart pump when it was too sick to pump on its own. And so when people got sick, they would just die. And they would die at home, because there weren't really hospitals. If there were, you probably couldn't get to them. You were too sick. So you would die at home, surrounded by everybody. And so people would watch you die. And in a way, you would pass on, this is how we die. And so we had people who were very familiar with death. It was everywhere in society. It was unpreventable. Women died after childbirth at outrageous rates. Children died of diseases that they don't die of anymore. You didn't really live to be 80 or 90 because you would get sick and you would die. You would die of pneumonia. You would die of a urinary tract infection. When you got sick, we couldn't do anything about it and you died. Everyone saw it happen, it was normal, it was accepted. But then things started to change. 
around the late 1800s is when things started to change with the Industrial Revolution, public health, hygiene, sewage wasn't running through the streets anymore. We were making some pretty big leaps and bounds as a society. And Ignaz Simmelweis was a Hungarian doctor who stumbled upon an important discovery. He noticed that the women who he would deliver babies from would often die of childbed fever. They would get very sick after delivering birth and died. And he had a number of theories around why this happened. And they were all absolute lunacy. He thought that the priest ringing the bell when they walked through the hallways of the hospital to declare the death of a woman scared the other women into getting childbed fever. Not true. One of his ideas was that the scent of the smoke that was coming through with the priest was also scaring people. And that the scent of dead bodies on his hands, because he would do autopsies on, on all of these women, was also scaring people. And so he decided to wash his hands in chlorine to get rid of the smell. Well, women stopped dying of childbed fever. It had nothing to do with his hypothesis, but it worked. And hand washing revolutionized medicine. Suddenly, people stopped dying because of infections from their surgery or from their health care. And sterility became the rule. About 40 years later, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. Also an accident. Fleming was working with cultures and went away on vacation and came back and found that some of them were growing mold. They were growing bacteria. They had fuzz on the petri dishes, but not the ones that had penicillin. And he thought, oh wow, I've discovered an antibiotic. When really, he was very lazy. He let his cells get contaminated. <laughs> but here he is saying, I found penicillin. It would take another 10 years before penicillin would become industrialized and available to people. But these two accidental heroes 100 years ago began saving lives through things like antibiotics and hand washing. And then we had some real heroes come around with inventions in the 1940s when the polio epidemic was taking the world by storm. And the iron lung was invented. The iron lung is a very fancy machine, but it works very simply. It decreases the pressure inside the chamber while your head is outside of the chamber, sealed by rubber. And that causes your chest to expand outwards, and it sucks air in when your muscles are too weak because they're paralyzed by the polio virus. The polio virus isn't that permanent on your lungs. You just need to get through it, kind of like you do with the common cold or influenza. And if you can get through it, then you can breathe on your own again. And so the iron lung came out, and we were saving even more lives. And then people really started to think. Now we're kind of post-World War II. Medicine is a really hot topic. And we get the birth of an intensive care. And three things happened in the 60s and 70s, coming out of the polio epidemic and the iron lung, that helped intensive care. First, instead of using giant iron lungs to create negative pressure, we invented small ventilators that, instead of making your chest suck air in, the ventilator would just push air down your windpipe using positive pressure. Around the same time, Automobiles were becoming very popular, and a lot of people were dying in road traffic accidents. At the same time, medics were coming back from the Vietnam and Korean wars and needed jobs. And so in many countries, ambulance services were born. Let's put the vets to work, and let's go and treat people with road traffic accidents. And then a third thing was happening. Technology was improving. Iron lungs were becoming small ventilators. Defibrillators that shock the heart to beat normally, that are, used to be the size of dishwashers, are now becoming handheld, like this one by Frank Pantridge. And so now we have this network of mobile responders staffed by coming out of the wars. We've got tools and technology that are being miniaturized, made portable. 
that can now get to people in time to give them triphosphate. And then a conveyance to hospitals. And now we have a whole network, a whole infrastructure that permits critical care, that permits the modern ICU. And by the 70s, every hospital had a modern ICU. And that's where we entered the gray zone. Because now you didn't just, now we tried to stop it. We attached you to machines and we hoped you would recover. And a lot of the time you did. But sometimes you didn't. But you were stuck on these machines. What do we do when it becomes clear that the technology isn't working? Okay, we have to take a pause. We're going to go back. Because something else was happening in the 50s and 60s that was super cool, and it had nothing to do with the ventilator, and it had nothing to do with antibiotics. And that was organ transplant. Organ transplant was this new budding area of medicine that was really, really exciting and really, really kind of fantasy. But it was becoming reality. We were understanding the immune system and organ rejection, and we were getting better and better surgical techniques because surgeons were practicing. They were practicing on dogs and monkeys and people. And eventually, they got it right in 1967, when Louis Wyshansky was the first heart transplant recipient to survive. This is Christian Bernard. He's a South African who trained in Minnesota, who went to Cape Town. He was a little bit crazy. He said, I'm going to be the first person to transplant a human heart. And it worked. There's Lewis with his new heart. He lived for 18 days before dying of pneumonia. Where'd the heart come from? The heart came from a woman named Denise Darval. She was 25. This made headlines around the world. Everyone was fascinated. The human heart transplant has worked. And then people started asking, well, what was the deal with Denise? Denise was struck by a car while she was crossing the road near Grotesker Hospital. Grotesker Hospital is gorgeous. It's set right inside the mountain behind where the sun sets in Cape Town. Cape Town's a beautiful city. The northeast coast on the Atlantic, going all the way down into the Cape where the Indian and Atlantic Oceans meet. It's a beautiful city. The sunset? perfect every single night. And set in this sort of neoclassical infrastructure with a terracotta roof is the pride in Cape Town, Grotesker Hospital, where Christian Bernard worked. I went to Grotesker, where they preserved the operating room where the first human heart transplant occurred. And I learned how controversial and muddy the story of Denise actually is. Denise was not dead when they took her heart from her. She was pretty dead, like she was going to be dead soon, like she was on her way to becoming dead, like death was in process, the ATP levels were not all there, but she wasn't dead. If you read this here, it says, poor LA Times, this is an error. Denise Starval was identified as a young woman whose heart was transplanted into a man after she died in car crash. She did not die in a car crash. She was really brain injured in a car crash. And depending on who you believe, there was some shady business that went on in order for them to be able to transplant her heart. A little loophole was exploited in South African law where brain death was somewhat defined as death, but how you determine if the brain is dead was not. Sort of just left up to a good guess. Most countries talked about the heart stopping. Of course, once the heart stops, the heart starts to die. You know, not very good for transplant. You want a nice, fresh heart. So there was sort of a, a convoluted, mm, you know, breaking of the rules here to get Louis Roshansky heart. And so now we needed to be able to define death, right? We needed an actual definition of when you're dead and when you're not dead. And so this one's easy. Somatic death is when your heart stops. When your heart stops, you're dead. If you don't have a heart beating, 
then there's not any blood flow to your brain. Your brain's not going to get adenosine triphosphate. Your cells are going to slowly explode, and then you'll be dead. It takes about four minutes. But there was more of a struggle to define brain death when the rest of the body is being preserved by technology and modern medicine, but the brain itself is pooched. Think shot in the head, in the head with a bat, hit by a dump truck. The brain is fried. But how do we know that? How do we define that for sure? Well, this would be the part of the talk where people start to fall asleep, so I'm going to skim through this. But a lot of different people started looking at this with a fair sense of urgency. And over 50 years, there were rules that were iterated. And this was so important that it was a president's commission in the United States. People were desperate to know, well, when are you actually dead? Because once you're dead, we can take your organs, give them to other people so that they can live. And so the organ transplant bit comes into this. It's unavoidable because it leads us down the road of understanding why we need to understand when technology is simply sustaining your body and not offering you a route to recover. OK, we can unpause now. OK, so let's do a quick little recap here. We have antibiotics, we hand hand washing, people aren't dying of infections anymore. We have ventilators, we have ICU technology, people are able to live even when their most vital organs are super sick. And we can even swap out your organs some of the time through the miracle of transplant. We can avert that. And when you are dead, maybe we can help some other people with some bits and pieces. OK, so that's it, right? That's like the story of modern medicine, the story of critical care, what I do for a living every day. I could probably wrap it up now. <laughs> Except we're actually just at the beginning of the journey now. And the reason many of you are probably here tonight is because in our effort to save lives, we sometimes find ourselves in a place where we can't. But, unlike in the past, death doesn't actually arrive. We're in this gray zone. So, as we go into this, I just want to be crystal clear about one thing. Technology saves people's lives. This isn't a bunch of Yahoo doctors out there doing all sorts of stuff when it's all meaningless because the person never had a chance to begin with. Although that does happen, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what we all want to do when our brain is winging a little bit and our heart is working a little bit, but only because of all of the machines attached to us. And how do we decide that it's time to get off the fence and just give up? I don't like the term pull the plug. My palliative care colleagues hate the term. But it's what my patients' families always say to me. They say, we don't want to pull the plug. Are you suggesting we pull the plug? I think we should pull the plug. It's just the terminology that's colloquial. So let's respect it. What it means is that we're not going to throw technology at people anymore. And we're going to stand by and watch adenosine triphosphate fall to zero. And then that person will experience what I would describe as a natural death. And so, in many ways, I wrote this book because I don't know when to recommend that we pull the plug. I wrote this book because since I do know we should pull the plug and people push back against me. And I wrote this book because there are times I have recommended pulling the plug and been shocked that someone has recovered and that my recommendation was incorrect. And so that's a problem, right? Like that's a big problem for me as a professional lifesaver. It's a bigger problem for you as someone who isn't a professional lifesaver and relies on my opinion to help guide your own decision making. When do we switch from resuscitate to palliate? I decided that I would ask a whole bunch of people 
because I wasn't getting very good answers from doctors. Because we don't have the answer. We don't know. We make it up. Based on my experience and based on the studies and based on what I'm seeing in front of me and based on what I know of the patient and how they've done over the last two weeks, my strong opinion is X, Y, Z. Sometimes I say things like, let's give it a few more days. No idea why I said that. I do, I, maybe I'm not ready. I'm not there yet to give up. Maybe I say, I think we're just not going to offer dialysis. I think I'm just not going to offer to intubate this patient. I'm just not going to put it on the table because I know where this is going. And so I decided to get advice from people who weren't doctors. So I spoke to a historian. He's a death historian at the University of Georgia. This is a job title somewhere. And I said, how on earth did we get here? And he said, it's simple. People don't view death as inevitable anymore. They used to, now they don't. And he had all sorts of really interesting insights about how, over the last 50 years, we've come to think we're not going to die. And so we don't even talk about it. We don't even think about it. One of the things he talked about was how, with social media and our internet world these days, we're always kind of seeing a reflection of ourselves. Algorithms, feedback we already know, things that we agree with. And so we're sort of getting a little egotistical. We're not necessarily trusting experts as much as we used to. We're thinking maybe that we're more expert ourselves. And through this sort of phenomenon of egotism, we've begun to sort of think, well, I'm not going to die. I want the surgery. I want the ventilator. Me, me, me. It's become lost on us because we're no longer witnessing death on a daily basis. Instead of being familiar, it's become foreign. I went to the theologists because very often people will say, we're gonna, we want you to pull the plug because she's very religious and she, she's going to go to God. And then another family of the same faith will say, we're very religious and so you're not allowed to pull the plug. We have to leave it in God's hands. <laughs> These two cases were in the same hospital during the same week of service. They were the same religion. It was so similar. The cases were so similar. And the families were so different. And so I asked a lot of theologists what we should do about this. And they say, well, you know, the answers are that people are deriving are coming from religious texts that were written before you had all of this technology. And so everybody's making it up. You would talk to some pastors, priests, imams, rabbis, and they would say, okay, so some of my are going to tell you this. This is what I do. Uh, I actually have a workaround to this religious rule. And so there's not a lot of consistency amongst the senior religious leaders about how we handle this current dilemma. In some hospitals where there is a, a religious reluctance to pull the plug, they power circuit on a timer. And then they don't reset the timer. And so non-intervention, choosing not to reset the timer, is the workaround for physically turning off the machine. And it's like very publicly discussed that like, oh, this is our workaround for the religious rule. We just do this and we, we trick God. And so, but this is something that religions are struggling with. And this is something that religions internally are still trying to figure out. What do we do about this challenge of technology interrupting death? I will often ask people when they tell me a religious view that is affecting their decision to go and check in with their religious leader. And a lot of the time they'll come back and say, oh, good news, we were wrong. <laughs> Turns out we're okay to move forward. And so there is a lot of perceptions out there that don't always match 
uh, the doctrine that people um, might think that they're following. Uh, I talked to a couple sociologists who sort of said, well, you know, this is a doctor problem. You guys haven't been out there selling a natural death well enough. If you watch television shows, 97% of resuscitations survive. And so people say, you know, everyone survives when you do CPR on television. So do CPR on me. Everyone does well. So I would like that chance also. The ethicist, oh, I thought the ethicist would like answer my question. Oh, I was wrong. The ethicist gave me an earful. Really fascinating to talk to ethicists about this. But the ethicist often told me viewpoints that were specific to where they worked. So when I was in California, the ethicist would say, well, this is what we do because of these California tort laws and because of these legal cases that have occurred in California. And so when certain things happen, we actually tell people, just go out of state, and then another state can deal with it. <laughs> so that's not really very consistent. <laughs> so that was the ethicist's viewpoint in California. The ethicists in New York City were like, oh, Canada, good luck. You guys are way too democratic for us. In the States, it's easy. In New York, it's easy. The doctors say, we're not going to provide care for you anymore. Go find someone who will. And if you can't afford it, we're just going to turn off the machine Sunday at midnight. Here's a letter. You can be here, you cannot be here. They just make a In the UK, they sort of use a little bit of, um, I'll call it common sense. You know, everybody loves the NHS. Not, not really. Everyone says, you know, they believe in the NHS. Well, I don't know. You know, you go to London and nobody wants you to get rid of the NHS, but they all kind of complain about it. But they have this sense of ownership over it. And so they're sort of less tolerant as a society of burning billions of dollars of having people requiring intensive care who aren't going to benefit from it. And so they kind of just walk in and go, oh, you're 80, you have lung disease, you have heart disease, you can't come to the ICU. And then they kind of leave. We'll try to help you with other techniques, but you're not coming to the ICU. The lawyers <laughs> are interesting to talk to. So doctors like to save people's lives, right? And, and lawyers like to protect people's rights. And sometimes, if a doctor says, I don't think you should be on a ventilator, the lawyer says, well, they have the right to be on a ventilator. I'm not arguing that they have the right to be on a ventilator. It's just a stupid idea to put them on a ventilator, right? Like, I know they have the right, but it's not smart, right? <laughs> and so sometimes the lawyers, they're, they're being very protective of individual rights, and I respect that very much. They bring such passion to that. But sometimes I feel like the doctors are just saying, it just doesn't make any sense. And so we get battles. And there have been a couple famous battles, the Takesha McKitty case at Brampton Civic Hospital. I was in the courtroom for that as a journalist, not as a defendant. But the hospital was being sued by the family to keep, it's very sad, a brain dead woman in her 20s alive. I guess alive is the wrong word. Sustained on technology. They did this for 15 months. It was going through appeals processes, and then her body gave out despite all the technology, 15 months after she was declared brain dead. When this happened, I texted my editor, a source from the hospital texted me, she's dead. And I'm like, oh, what? I wasn't expecting it. It was over the holidays. I was like, oh. I texted my editor at the Toronto Star. I said, McKitty's dead. My editor's like, what do you mean? She's been dead for 15 months. No, no, she's dead dead. Like, she's totally dead now. And it's not uncommon for us in healthcare to use the term dead dead. My favorite interview was with an old timer. He had been a physician in rural Nova Scotia since 1968, the year after the first heart transplant. His cooped up in a cabin during the COVID pandemic, and we were, I was interviewing him over Zoom. And he said, Blair, back in the 70s, we would just say, you know, we're not going to offer something. 
we think it's a bad idea. The physicians had all the power. He said that wasn't a good thing. We had too much power. But now he had felt the pendulum had swung far towards patient autonomy, where families could say, we want you to put them on a machine. And even if all of the doctors had consensus that that was a terrible idea, sometimes physicians feel compelled to offer things that they don't really believe are wise. And here's the problem. When you come into hospital and you're stressed, someone's dying, and you meet an ICU doctor, you get even more stressed. And then the ICU doctor says something along the lines of, you know, have you guys ever talked about like what you would want done if they were like super sick? And you're like, oh, you know, like no, because like who does that, right? Except for all of you tomorrow. Um, <laughs> And so then you say, well, I don't know, I have to call my sister and see what my sister thinks. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, adenosine triphosphate, like, can you, like, get back to me soon? Yeah, 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 okay, okay, I'll let you know. And then they come back and they say, oh, well, we're still talking about it, but for now, can you just do everything? Just, just do everything. And then the doctor goes, everything, got it, okay, check. And then they go and they do everything. The problem is with the term everything. Everything is an lot of things when you're in a modern ICU. And there aren't many doctors who have to provide everything. Surgeons are allowed to say, I'm not going to operate on you. I think it's a bad idea. You can't say, I disagree. Get your scalpel. <laughs> They're just like, no. Surgeons can do that. But for ICU doctors, it's a little bit more difficult to walk in and say, we're not going to offer dialysis, and we're not going to offer you a breathing tube, and we're not going to offer you chest compressions because we can't recover this. Families say, oh, we want you to do everything. And they like, sometimes they give us a look. Like, you better. OK. And then I kind of go and I do everything. And so this is a huge question about where we are right now, where in society, people want everything even when the doctors are saying, hmm, are you sure? And so what have a lot of doctors done? We're paid by the hour. It's not worth it. I'm not going to argue with you. You want everything? I'll give you everything. No problem. And so then you get lines and tubes and machines. And so this led me to an equation. All of these interviews were useful. I started forming an, a, a hypothesis. I said, oh, I know the problem. I get it now. Technology has facilitated this death dilemma. If we didn't have technology, there would be no death dilemma, because you would die, because there's no technology to save you, right? But now technology, we have to face these two things in society that have happened. The first I call resuscitation glorification. TV, maybe a bit of doctors, oh, we can help, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And people go, great, give it to me. And then we have this sort of, this death denialism, this death as a foreign concept or as something that other people but not ourselves. And when you take all three of these things and make them happen at the same time, you get a problem that I think is like maybe as serious as climate change. Like it's really, really scary to me that we have this death dilemma, this situation because technology is only becoming more and more and more popular. There's only more and more of it. It's not like we're going to have it as a limited resource. Even during the pandemic, we just made more ventilators. We made it work. And so as things progress, we're going to have more and more and more technology as people live with more and more and more medical diseases. And that's going to create this environment where you don't have prospect recovery. You are confined to an ICU bed, hooked up to machines, and you're never going to make it out alive. We live in a world now where death feels off limits. And so flipping the switch from resuscitate to palliate is sometimes impossible. There are families who come to the ICU and say, they're not going to die. 
how can I have a conversation about resuscitate or palliate when death is not on the table? If you're in the ICU, death is on the table. Something is going on. But families come in all the time and say, hard stop, we're not discussing palliation. There's no way you're removing those machines. And that has created this untenable future for us. So, now you're thinking, okay, let's take all the crazy families and tell them no. Right? That's like my solution, right? But there is an elephant in the room that we need to talk about. And this is where people get mad at me. I'm not always right when I say we probably shouldn't use technology. And I'm not always right when I say it's time to flip the switch. And patients aren't always right when they say, oh, no, thank you. I have an advanced directive. I never want a ventilator. To say I never want a ventilator is like saying I never want to get on an airplane. Well, what if the airplane was a private jet? People, oh, okay, well, sure, I'll fly a private jet. Sometimes people should never be on a ventilator. Like, I can say that really confidently. Sometimes you have a lobular bacterial pneumonia that I can push you through four days tops on a ventilator. I know I can push you through that. And people say, oh, no, no, thank you. I don't want a ventilator. I've heard that when you're on a ventilator, like, it's terrible and you die. And I'm like, well, yeah, some people die. But I actually, I think I can get you through this. So we have sort of people who have said everything when we're like, oh, that's a terrible idea. And then we, people, we have people who say, oh, no, thank you. I've thought about this. I'm ready to go. And for people with chronic diseases, for people with incurable diseases, that makes perfect sense to me. But when people have a temporary disease, something about me goes, oh, man, that's, that disease is what the ventilator is for. You had a UTI and the bacteria slipped into your blood. I can push you through that. It just takes 24 hours. And then there are those cases where I say, I cannot believe we're doing what we're doing and people make it. And then I'm affected by the cases where I say, we should definitely do more, and people make it. This gray zone between resuscitate and palliate isn't always easy to nail. And so in, in healthcare, we call this prognosis. We call this trying to predict what's going to happen with somebody based on all the information we have on them. Um, the definition of prognosis is that it is an art and not a science. There's a fair amount of science brought in. You can see here it uses the, an act of judgment, which should scare everybody because that means it's made up, right? It means it's up to me to think of what might happen using my best abilities. I'm a pretty good physician. I'm right most of the time, but there are times that I'm wrong. And so I asked a lot of very, very senior physicians who have been doing this job since ventilators became. One of them actually invented the ventilator. He's no longer practicing, but I was like, hey, I'm kind of messed up in the head over this. What's the answer? And they say, oh, the longer you do this, it only gets worse. <laughs> You'll start to believe in miracles. You'll start to question why you bother to come to work to feed and water bodies that have no chance of survival. It's going to mess with you your entire career. None of them had a good answer for me, except to say you're on the right path if you're acknowledging the gray zone. And so now I've painted a fairly gloomy picture, right? Like, now what do we do? How do we overcome the death dilemma? And so I'm going to give you two nuggets of information here 
before we enter a question and answer period. I have been criticized for using the phrase rolling the dice. Not every ICU doctor thinks that that's an accurate reflection of what you're doing when you accept care from an ICU. But what you're doing is you're saying, I'm willing to put myself through surgery. I'm willing to put myself through a week in the ICU. I'm willing to put myself through mechanical ventilation. And let's see if it works. The threshold for rolling the dice is different for everybody. Some people like Vegas and some people don't. But if you're going to roll the dice, and this is a unique situation because sometimes you don't have a choice, right? You're being told sudden, it's not like, hey, do you want to go to Vegas? Ah, no thanks, I'm busy that weekend. It's like, hey, you're in the ICU, it's time to roll the dice. And so you kind of want to know how a craps table works, right? Like you want to know what the odds are. And so what you have to do here tonight or tomorrow or next week is think about what does this mean for me if I have to roll the dice? And the tricky part is that it will change depending on why you're in the ICU. It will change depending on who you are, who your family are, what your values are, and what your condition is. You'll be rolling the dice. You can roll the dice either way you like. That's a personal choice. But you have to know that you're rolling the dice because no one's going to tell you. Because I'm playing a chess game and the ventilator is my rook and the adrenaline infusion is my bishop. All I'm trying to do is keep you alive. And I can't always see the forest through the tree. Sometimes I'm saying, okay, what's my next move as an ICU doctor? Because this is all I'm thinking about. And it's up to you and your family to come to me and say, wait a minute. Tell us more about adenosine triphosphate and what you're doing to preserve it. Because I open this talk by saying that this is life, but it's not. It's just chemistry. It's just a chess game. Life is not something I'll define today. I'll leave it to you to define. But adenosine triphosphate isn't really life. Because I've seen a lot of people with adenosine triphosphate who would be better off without any. And that's the consequence of modern medicine. That's the consequence of technology and the changes in society where we have the tools but not always the wisdom to know if we should start using them, continue using them, or pack them up. I became a physician because I didn't think people should die too early. And then throughout my experiences realized that sometimes people died too late. And they did so without a say in it. There's no shame in dying on a ventilator. There's no shame in trying a surgery with a high mortality rate and not pulling through. But you got to know ahead of time that you're rolling the dice. And that you might end up in a long-term care facility bed-bound, dependent on others for care. And if that's something that you would never ever want, you could say no to the offering. But if that for you works, if you're like, okay, I, I'm willing to take that chance, then you go for it. Someone's going to die too late. In medicine, we are pioneers. We try new stuff to see if it works, just like Apple, like Google. The problem is I test it on human bodies, and sometimes it doesn't work. But if I didn't do it, we wouldn't have the first heart transplant or the thousands of heart transplants that have happened since. We wouldn't have antibiotics, we wouldn't have mechanical ventilators if we didn't try the iron lung on people with polio. 
And so in order to be pioneers, you have to try stuff in medicine, and sometimes it won't work. But we've fallen behind in developing the wisdom to know what to do when we end up in that boat where we're tethered to machines and we can't get off of them. Thank you so much for attending tonight. Wow, what a wonderful personal journey you shared with us just here on stage as you did in your book. Very personal, very open, very um, thought-provoking and uh, normalizing. We're dead, <laughs> which is a good thing <laughs> and so fitting with Advanced Care Planning Month. So thank you again. and. Um, I'm welcoming mm -hmm. Helen Long, who is the Executive Director of Dying with Dignity Canada, and she's going to be our moderator for taking questions from the floor, and we'll also have questions from our Zoom audience. Thanks. Uh, so what we're going to do, we have two microphones set up. Uh, people can come up to the mics. Sharon's going to make sure everything's working. Please speak directly into the microphone so everyone in the room and everyone on Zoom can hear. Uh, at the same time, we're taking questions. Uh, I'm not on my phone. I'm reading questions. <laughs> we're taking questions from the panelists. So maybe as people are getting set, we also have a runner. So if anyone can't get out of their uh, maybe put their hand up and the runner will uh, bring the mic to you. So while we're getting set here, I'll start with one from the, uh, uh, from the Zoom audience. Uh, so <laughs> great question. How can I get you when I go to the ICU? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, there's more. <laughs> How do we trust that the doctor we get will be honest and direct like you are, or competent and capable, and not someone who just takes their goes home? Uh, you talked about physicians being professional lifesavers. It makes me think that people might believe that we don't have to have the conversations or think about death. Is there a way for healthcare providers to shift the narrative of professional lifesaver? So physicians are, I think, universally interested in the death dilemma. I think this is something that affects all of us when we go to work. And practice experiences, people have different approaches to how to handle it. And my more experienced colleagues have taught me so much about how to approach these types of conversations and difficult decision making. And I think in Canada, uh, you're in very good hands if you go to an ICU, whatever hospital you go to. And I've, um, when you come out of fellowship, you have to work kind of everywhere until people decide they like you. I've worked at about a dozen hospitals in the last year. Some of them very, very small. Some of them, uh, some of the biggest in the country. And universally, I have been blown away by the nursing teams, the allied health teams, and the physician teams. So I don't think you need me. I think... Um, uh, the reason I wrote this book was because I was early enough in my career that I saw the struggle it was causing universally. And so I may have been one of the people who have been more vocal to label it, uh, but I think all ICU doctors want to nail this and get it right for each and every patient. Um, and so I think you can have a lot of confidence that when you go to the ICU, people are there to, to help you through it. Their style and approach may be different from mine. Um, and this is something that's been studied very well in terms of how we can coach medical students and residents to do a better job. Um, because there's always room for improvement. And that's something that we're always looking at. Um, but I think to more directly answer the question, um, just bring it up. Bringing it up, opening the conversation, signals to the physician that um, that there's space to have this talk. And so uh, physicians are going to appreciate that space being opened up to them, and they'll give you their best assessment. And that assessment will change over time. It can change over hours, it can change over days, it can change over weeks. I've had patients in hospital for over a year. Um, and I say, keep going. Uh, I'm going to get you out of here. Um, I've had patients um, in hospital for hours. And I say, the best thing I can do for you right now is load you up with really good drugs and help you die comfortably. Um, so it's so situational. It depends on the context. Um, 
but trust your healthcare team. Canada has, for all its faults, a really, really strong critical care system. It's good to know. Is there a question in the room? Let's see if we've got anything online. Oh, there we go. Uh, thanks. Uh, great talk. So it seems like a lot of the kind of burden of like making decisions falls on a one per one physician kind of model. Um, do you think it might alleviate some of like either like as a physician a personal kind of struggle um, to kind of like have a like a little a court like a little couple of physicians um, to adjudicate for these more complicated case-by-case -case, um, scenarios? A lot of ICUs are, are single doc ICUs where there's one doctor on. Um, my favorite hospitals to work in are where there's two or three ICU doctors on at a time because we can get these ideas off of each other. We can, and, and we all know each other's cases. We can say, hey, like, I don't have any other ideas for this patient. The other night, I woke up my chief. I called my chief at 11 p.m. And I said, Marty, I got nothing left here. Like, I feel like I should be able to keep the adenosine triphosphate levels going. Like, and, and so we do consult here and we do speak to each other. It's so much easier when there's a couple of you around. Um, and we reach out to other consultants. I'll talk to a neurologist, a cardiologist, I'll say, like, an oncologist, like, do you have anything to offer? Like, I'll talk to the surgeon, I'll say, can you do anything to help me here? Um, I'm stuck, I'm running out of options. And so we do consult other doctors and other health professionals and kind of go to the end of our limits, see what we can offer. When it comes to making some of those more um, personal decisions with families, it is helpful to have a one-on-one -on -one contact and you know, we normally work seven days in a row. And so at the end of the seven days, a new person comes on. And then it takes another couple of days to like gain trust and rapport and get to know people. And so it is tricky um, to, to, to do this and not feel like the burden's all on yourself. Uh, great question from the Zoom audience. Uh, an end of life doula. So this person says, I see huge potential in working with patients and families in dealing with the death dilemma. Uh, do you have any recommendations for doulas as to how to find a way into the medical field or hospitals? Um, I've never been asked that question before. I think I often invite in people who are known to the family and trusted by the family to help when there's maybe disagreements, like if there's a number of siblings and they're at odds, I'll say, you know, who else can I bring in here? Is there an auntie who's like the matriarch of the family who's gonna come in and set everybody straight? Like, who can I call to help? Um, and so for some families that may be a death doula, I think um, in the hospital we have social workers, we have counselors, we have um, a number of non-physician, I'll use that term, allied health workers who work with families, uh, they have more time than maybe the physician does to explore some of those options. Um, the, the tension comes in that physicians are always gonna default to looking for ways to improve adenosine triphosphate levels, right? Like we're gonna say, what else can I offer you to help you get through this? And sometimes it does need to be the family or the social worker who comes in as like, Blair, like the family says stop. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't picking up on that. And my social worker's like, you're an idiot. Do you not pick up on that? The family says no more. Okay, that's helpful for me. I have to get out of my own head and, and hear what the family is saying. Um, and death doulas may very well play a role in that. Mm. The, um, this, the next question is about, this is something we hear very often at, uh, more and more recently at Dying with Dignity, and it's been in the news a little bit lately. There's a bill uh, in European countries. Uh, what are your thoughts around a chosen death? So that's basically a death in old age before that inevitable loss of independence and, mm -hmm. and health. Uh, any thoughts on that? I think this is something that Canada um, maybe hasn't been a leader on, but has at least been doing its best to stay up to date on. Um, in the ICU, we don't have a lot of medically assisted deaths, chosen deaths, aside from you know, maybe deciding to take the machines out of the room, in which case people usually die quite quickly. 
But I think there's a really interesting debate to be had around that because there's a bit of semantics at play here. I turn off all the machines and then I kind of just let you gasp and linger for a couple hours until you, you, know, you die. Um, what's the difference between that and maybe a, a quicker death that's medically assisted? Um, I think there'll be lots of conversations to come about how um, a chosen death in the ICU can be made better than it is now. Because the current approach is simply to say, we'll just turn everything off and maybe go in a few minutes, maybe go in a few hours, maybe go in a few days. But there's always uncertainty around it. And it, sometimes it just doesn't work well. You know, four family members come and they set up and there's prayers and then I turn off the machines and then I wait a few hours and I'm like, oh, they haven't died yet. And the family's like, hey, they haven't died yet. Like, did we make the wrong decision? I'm like, no, 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 they're definitely gonna die. Like, it just, it just hasn't happened yet. And then they say, oh, they're stronger than we thought they were. I'm like, no, 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 they're not stronger. It's just the ATP didn't drop as fast as I thought it would. Like, just, you know, and then every good ICU nurse knows that when it's about to die, if you turn them to like reposition their pillow, mm -hmm. it'll, you know, speed things up a little bit. Um, and you know, there's, uh, there's a semantic around it. The patient's gonna die, it's guaranteed. And so why don't we just get on with it? I think that's a very fair question that mm -hmm. should be asked of intensivists more often. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting, you know, from our perspective on the advocacy front and mm -hmm. looking at advanced requests road in particular, I think it's interesting to look at where's that line, you know, once the decision's been made, how long do you wait or do you need to wait? Yeah. Um, and it, how would that work? Another complicating factor is, you know, if you're going to say, well, this is just a bacterial pneumonia, you can get over this with a few days of technology, when, you know, sometimes they'll be wrong, right? Or you'll have a complication or you'll get sicker. And at, at some point we then have to say, well, we have this directive, when are we going to stop? Because it, it would be similarly concerning if people showed up with these directives and just never received health care, right? Because people were like, oh, they, like, they don't want antibiotics. Well, no, that's not what a do not resuscitate is. That's not what an advanced directive might say. But there's this underlying tone of, we don't really need to figure this out. This person's on the way out anyway. And sometimes they are, but sometimes, it's, sometimes we can make them better. Mm -hmm. You touched on, I think, um, the context of this a little bit in some of your comments, but one issue that can cause a lot of moral distress for healthcare workers is providing CPR for people that, that yeah. you know is, are dying. Uh, is it ever appropriate to say, no, we're not providing CPR? Yeah, it is. Um, and nurses suffer when physicians do from this, this burnout around providing care to people as they're dying. I've seen nurses quit the profession over it. I've seen nurses suffer from traumatic stress. I've seen nurses um, refuse to care for a patient or refuse to execute a physician order on a patient because they're just so, uh, the, they would use the term like ethically conflicted. They'd be like, what we're doing wrong, like just let them die. Um, and so it's very, very messy. Um, and, and nurses in particular uh, feel the brunt of that. Um, I think the, the way forward on that is to have the conversation ahead of time that CPR is probably not going to make a difference in this situation and everybody on the same page early. So sometimes CPR works, right, for sure. Like if you collapsed right now, CPR would, like you'd survive, guaranteed, right? Like CPR would work if you had a heart attack and collapsed right now, I know that. Um, but for people who have multiple organ failure, uh, CPR almost never works. When you're on five ICU blood pressure support medications and you need CPR, no way that you're gonna survive. It's interesting, when I moved to California to train, I asked, I said, am I allowed to not offer CPR? And I had three physicians give me three different answers and I thought it was yes or no, but I. Nobody knew, but everyone thought they knew. They said, oh, no, you have to do it. And another one said, absolutely not. We don't provide non-beneficial care. And the other said, well, just call ethics. Like, call ethics. Like, the ethicist carries a cell phone 24-7. Just call the ethicist and ask them what to do. I'm like, that, seems, that doesn't seem like the answer either. So um, it's jurisdictional. It's medical legal. In Ontario, the College of Physicians and Surgeons just released a new policy that does permit physicians to not offer CPR. 
But what else I cannot offer is still a bit unclear to me. And I had a case recently where I was again on the phone with my chief saying, I don't want to offer a certain thing. And my chief said, oh, I, I, think, you, I think you should. Not because it'll work, but because I don't want to deal with the hassle of what's going to come if you decline. The family said this and that. The family's very um, uh, involved in a way that um, uh, I think raises worries about litigation and things like that. And so, you know, I'm on service for seven days. I said, fine, I'll just offer it. Like, sure, right? That's what the family wants. Fine, I think it's not right for this patient, but we'll just do it. Um, but we're making progress. The CPSO policy that allows me to withhold CPR unilaterally is helpful. Um, but I think we need a lot more clarity around where this pendulum is swinging to know how much power and authority does a physician have. It should certainly be limited. Um, but um, right now, it may be so limited that it's actually doing a disservice to people. Because when families say they want thing, usually it's because they're scared, right? They're not ready to lose somebody. They don't know what everything is. They don't know what everything entails. They just see the other side of the coin, which is death. And they say, well, we don't want death, and so you have to do whatever the opposite of death is. Yeah. And important to note in Canada, I think everyone knows health is legislated federally, but provincially delivered. So in every province, that rule could very well be different or slightly different. And there's a legal death in every province as well that's not always consistent, which is weird. Death is defined differently in different provinces, but that's kind of where we're at. Lots of things are different. Uh, we have a question over here. In your pres in Can your you speak right into the mic? Sorry. In your presentation, you talked about judgment quite a bit. So like part of my health care plan it's not based on, I don't want this instrument, I don't want this thing. But I directed my daughter to say, do not give her any care if she will not survive with a good quality of life. Mm -hmm. And I have defined to my daughter what I mean by quality of life. How much personal, how much judgment does a particular doctor have in deciding what good quality of life is? And I'll give you an example. I had surgery, abdominal surgery, a meter of my intestine was removed. After six weeks, I went to the surgeon for checkup. I could walk a block. I was very unhappy with that. She said, what more could you want? You're doing so well. You're 60 odd <laughs> years old. To me, that was not a good quality of life. To the yeah. doctor, it was. So how much judgment is that in there? Or is it in my health? I have to say, I have to be able to rock climb a 5'10". Right. I have to be able to walk <laughs> 10 kilometers. Or, I mean, how much do I have to put in there if I'm going to say something like, do not administer service if she will not survive with a good quality of life? Great question. I struggle on a 5'10", so let's at least lower the threshold a little <laughs> bit there. Um, uh, so I'm going to back up. A lot of the time, we talk about a menu. We talk about the menu of things that you can have in the hospital. And some doctors offer this menu, but people don't know what's on the menu, right? You know, well, maybe I'll try this one. Oh, okay, yeah, you can try that one. That one doesn't sound very good. Um, and so the best thing for an ICU doctor to do is say, what would an acceptable outcome be for this one? Because if we talk about alive and dead, I can almost guarantee that you won't die, but you would not be happy with that you would say, no, 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 I don't care about not dying. I want to know how much life I'm going to have. I want to have quality of life. And so if a family comes to me after someone's had a devastating stroke and says um, she was very proud, she did her hair before she went every day, um, she really valued communicating with her friends, and uh, uh, she went and played uh, bridge every Wednesday, uh, and she'd want to do all of that. I can say, oh, that'll never happen. Right? Based on the CT, that'll never happen. Um, the best case scenario is nursing home fully dependent on others. And people go, oh, no, I never want that. And so sometimes by knowing what people want as their sort of bare minimum, uh, I can at least say that's not something I can give you. 
with reasonable confidence most of the time. But sometimes you're going to have a particular disease that requires a particular treatment where one month out, you will be miserable. And 12 months will be at your baseline. You will be as good as you were before your event happened. Some diseases take time to heal. And so it can be very difficult for patients and their families to define what success looks like and physicians to be able to gauge if we can meet that definition of success. But I, I think most of the time, what you've laid out, if your daughter communicated to me, I would be able to say, based on your disease and maybe five days of you being in the ICU, maybe seven days, I, I can't say on day one a lot of the time. I need to know where things are gonna go. But within a week, I should be able to say, I probably can't do that. And then you have to make sure that your daughter knows how you want to roll the dice because it's unlikely that I'm going to say, I guarantee that she'll be able to climb a 510. I'll say, oh, probably. Like, yeah, I, th I think, that, you know, if she was climbing 510s before, there's a good chance she'll climb 510s after. And someone's going to have to say, well, is that chance better than ending up in a nursing home? And then I'm going to go, I don't know, like 50-50. Like, I might not be able to be too clear. And that's what all of this is about. Even in people who know what they want, I'm not always able to give the prediction. But I don't want to scare people because most of the time I can. Most of the time. If you come to me with something other than keep them alive, I'll be able to say I can do that or I can't do that. But sometimes it does get a little bit messier. And that's where families feel a lot of burden. So that touches, I think, on if you've read the book, there's five key takeaways at the end. Write it down, talk to your family and loved ones. And I think, you know, we talk about that all the time, but it's so important to write down exactly what you're thinking or what you want that to look like. Uh, I'm going to take one of the Zoom questions and then we'll have a question over here. So um, what should palliative care look like? That's a big question, but... Wow, I'm not a palliative care doctor. I know a lot of palliative care doctors. Um, I think palliative care is meant to help people achieve things that are meaningful for them in the time that they have left. And so palliative care focuses a lot on symptoms, a lot on how you're feeling, and a lot on what you want to achieve in a time-bound period. And then your palliative care team and your, I'll call them your resuscitation team, work together to gauge how much palliative care, how much resuscitative care do we do, and we can blend them pretty well as we go down the road of trying to make sure that you're achieving what you want to achieve. So if you came to me and said, uh, my granddaughter is due August 1st, I would really like to be able to hold my granddaughter. I'd be like, okay, August 1st, hold granddaughter. Here's what's required. And you go, sounds painful. Let's do it, right? It matters to me. I want to go for it. Or you say, oh, it's November. Can you just, you know, we really want them to live till Christmas. I'm like, well, we can, but like, they're not going to wake up and they're not going to know it's Christmas. And then they go, oh, okay, well, maybe, maybe we won't bother then. And so I think if you have goals, if you tell us what you want out of life, then we can tell you if we can get you there with reasonable certainty. But if you come to the table and just say, death is not an option, we just want life, I'm kind of like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Like, because like not many people want to be in a nursing home with a tracheotomy and a catheter mm -hmm. and have no awareness of what's going on around them and develop a sacral ulcer that penetrates into their bones. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know that anybody actually wants that. But families tell me, he told me to make sure no one gave up on him. I say, OK. But I don't think he was thinking of the sacral ulcer when he said that. Um, and here I am on day 146 going, oh my, you know, really? And then my judgments and my values start coming into it. And then I have to pull back. I say, well, no, it's not my loved one. But it does get very complicated. Um, when families approach it from an all or nothing perspective. But if they come and say, you know, they'd want to go home and garden. They loved gardening. 
I can say they'll never garden again a lot of the time. Or I can say, here's what's involved for the chance that they garden again. And then people can sort of help guide us. Interesting. It's, you know, you talk a bit in your book too about communication and the need for to communicate better, more. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think you're saying the things that many of us in that situation would want to need to have that conversation. And, and you know, we can ask, but also the doctor has to be prepared to share and to give those those options absolutely and it doesn't always have to be the doctor or i see is working in team nurses. so yep. it could be the bedside nurse who's there more available than i am mm. it's a social worker who works monday to friday which i used to think was a really sweet gig but then i realized that they work every week and so they're the longitudinal connection to families the doctors change every seven days Right? I'm in South Lake one day and Brampton the next day, and then I'm off in Oshawa. I'm all over the place. But the nurses and the social workers, they can be that longitudinal check-in. And so you can talk to anybody on the team. Sometimes you do need to drill the physician down and say, what do you think is achievable? Because the physician's baseline thought is like adenosine triphosphate levels are adequate. But that's not what you want. Just given the uh, extent of the technology now that's available to prolong life and, and sustain life, um, do you foresee a role in um, artificial intelligence being now incorporated into the decision-making process and, and uh, the ability for, for physicians to, to give prognosis that are based on you know, odds and that kind of, and, and uh, data, metadata, that kind of thing? Absolutely, that's a lovely question. Artificial intelligence is definitely gonna play a massive role in healthcare. It's going to, and soon, it's going to upend the way we do business. Uh, the way we do our jobs is gonna drastically change. There will be some jobs in healthcare that change faster than others. I think emergency medicine is one area that could very much be augmented by artificial intelligence. I think critical care, probably less susceptible to um, massive swings because critical care is, it's a very difficult game to play it takes a lot of feel to know how all the numbers are moving, shifting, and interacting with each other. Um, in emergency medicine, we're usually dealing with single organ failure. And so it's very helpful to ask a computer, why has this organ failed? If you have multi-organ failure, um, it's, it's trickier, I think, to gauge how things are going. With that said, it, I mean, in a way, I'm sort of pitching AI in critical care because if there's that much data, can a human being do it all? But I, I do think that critical care has an awful lot of art to it that my emergency medicine practice does not have. My emergency medicine practice is very algorithmic and would certainly be aided by artificial intelligence. I have more trouble seeing where AI comes into critical care in a way that makes sense to me. Prognosis is so messy, but maybe that's why AI should come into it. But I'm not aware of a lot of AI working with prognosis. We use some, in, we have some scores um, that uh, are computer generated. They're relatively um, blunt scores, uh, but I do think the future is going to have a lot more AI healthcare. Um, the path to AI in the ICU, though, is a little bit trickier for me to see. But there's a lot of hubris in that comment, too. Um, so as a doctor, do you actually look at the advanced directive, the piece of paper, or do you take direction <laughs> from the, the family oh member? God. And how do you know which family member? So for example, oh, if you have yeah. an adult child there, but maybe can't find the spouse. Yeah. So if there's a piece of paper, um, I'm going to see it. Um, I don't most of the time there isn't a piece of paper. We're told that, you know, apparently there's a piece of paper somewhere, but no one's ever seen it. The social worker will try to track it down to, to get it in the chart. Um, 
in Canada, or in Ontario, it's jurisdiction by jurisdiction, there's a list of who gets to decide first when someone doesn't have a power of attorney for personal. Um, and so we go down that list and the social worker will get everybody's names and positions and say, is anybody power of attorney? And if nobody says yes, then they go, okay, the decision maker is the spouse. Oh, the spouse is dead, okay, the decision maker, and it just goes down the list. And so it's inflexible. If you haven't already assigned someone, the list is in the law. Like, we will follow the list, we don't have a choice. And some get two decision makers of equal decision making authority, that's the worst, right? Because if they disagree, oh my goodness, mm. it's a really, really messy process. Um, and, and that happens not, not infrequently. Um, and so uh, the other thing we struggle with, and I'll just slip this in here, is sometimes the attorney or the substitute decision maker as determined by law will be acting in a way that is, is emotional or personal and is not in keeping with the written directives of the patient or the previously described directives of the patient. And that can also get a little bit messy. Um, and we have, we have some influence there to, to help guide people through the process. Um, when grief is what's causing the discrepancy, there are other secondary gain situations. You could imagine that somebody's life insurance payouts or um, Retirement payouts will stop on their death, and so there is a reluctance to allow someone to die. There, there are these messy, messy things that happen infrequently, but sometimes our social worker will come to me and say, God, guess what I found on their Facebook posts? They're actually running a GoFundMe, and they're saying all these crazy things. And So sometimes there are these aberrant things happening out there that, um, that are somewhat awkward for us to have to deal with. So the important thing is that whoever you're assigning, make sure they're gonna stand up to, you know, they're not gonna be bullied by your sister or your brother or your aunt or whoever. They're gonna say, no, mom said she would this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they need to be able to, to have that conviction. A difficult time though for, for people often. Um, can you comment a bit on when a person moves into the experience of active dying? Uh, are there medications you would say should be avoided? Are there things that families should be aware of? Active dying is like, that's my job, right? Like someone's actively dying before I breakfast <laughs> every morning and I'm like, all right, well stop their active death, right? Like my job is to walk that back. Um, and I can do that like a lot of the time. Like I've had people who are like very, very dead who I've been able to pull back off the cliff. But not dead dead. Not dead dead, they're like dead-ish. <laughs> but they're not dead dead, right? Dead dead is like you're in the elevator on the way down to the morgue, so. <laughs> Dead-ish, dead, yeah, you're pulseless, but like I got things to do, right? I'm really good at winning back ATP. Um, uh, and so it's, it's hard for me to answer that question. Th there are people who I say I'm not going to intervene upon this active dying person. I'm not going to offer CPR. I'm not gonna put a tube down their throat. And at that point, I'm going to, what I would like to do, unless there's some family imperative for me not to, is I like to go all in and make sure that you are comfortable. And if that means using sedatives or opioids, I am going to do that. Um, and so there are some diseases where the timing of death is uncertain, but the, the speed of death will be rapid. Certain respiratory failures, like you'll be okay until you're not okay and then you fall off the cliff. And so I'll tell families like, we've all agreed what we will and will not do, but just so you know, 3 a.m. if they fall off the cliff, the cliff I am going to aggressively palliate them. Like I am going to make them very comfortable and you're not gonna have time to drive in. Like it's just gonna happen and we're gonna respond quickly and we're gonna respond forcefully so that they don't struggle. Um, and families are usually very understanding of that. It, it's, it's difficult because if you're actively dying and I'm not intervening, we've probably missed the boat to like arrange for visits and things like that. Um, and so some families place a lot of weight on the value of being present during someone's death. And so you can't really wait for them to just like suddenly get worse because then it's too late. And sometimes we will use some life support to sustain a patient's life long enough for this to arrive. And I recently had someone who was flying in from Asia to be with a parent um, and uh, they, 
the flight was delayed in San Francisco. They had to connect, and there was a 13-hour delay. You can guess which airline. And I was just like, okay, well, I guess, I guess I'm sustaining the, you know, and I had to add more drugs. I'm like, well, you know, you don't fly from Asia to Singapore uh, to um, San Francisco and not make it. Like I've been doing this for two days. I can do it for 13 more hours. And so I kind of fiddled with a couple of dials and. And it worked, right? I got that patient to be able to, uh, to, to be present during death. So we, we do do that. We want to do that because p the death of a parent, you know, the death of somebody is usually very, very significant on people's lives. We want to support people through that. We're not bean counters who say, oh no, like spend money on this. We're turning off the machines as soon as it's demonstrated there's no benefit. We're human. We, we will keep people alive until everybody who needs to come can come. Uh, when it's within our scientific ability to do so. Um, uh, but for other times, when it's time to palliate in the ICU, usually we have to palliate pretty hard and fast. Is there a final question in the room? I know we're getting close to the end. Yeah. This has been wonderful. Um, going back to what you were saying before about the position you're in when um, you're not clear about what the person wanted. I do ACP groups, and I have to tell you that the most difficult part of going through all of it is people choosing their substitute to sink. Mm. And we go back, and we go back, and I want all my children to be involved, and I say it's strongly advised not to because of some of the things you said. Um, should I do this? Should I do that? I don't. You know, I don't think that person can handle it. And I say, this is what you need when you can't speak. It's for you, but it's also, and you've made me more aware of it now, how much, well, I won't use the word easier, but efficient it would be if you had that in hand. So really, I'm telling everybody in the audience who has an ACP or wants to make us an ACP to download it from the uh, website at Dignity Canada and start thinking about who is capable and willing to speak for you when you can't. You're not making the decisions, you're the mouthpiece for the person that you love. And that's so important. It is important and it's often forgotten by people and so I think many people think that their decision maker should be their next of kin, the person they love the most, the person they're closest to. It doesn't have to be. You can give the responsibility to somebody else and give your, give your person a break and have somebody else who knows you as well to maybe be a little bit more objective or, or to take the bullet and say, I mean, you know, if you wanted me to make this tough decision, I'll make the tough decision. Yeah, I encourage people to think out of the box yeah. and to really talk and, and even to bring up with potential SDMs mm -hmm. whether you want to or not. The whole pivot is communication yeah. and clearly you have those skills and you work with people that have those skills but so many people don't or if they do they're afraid to broach the subject. Yeah. So. Um, the best setting, you know, go to a greasy spoon for breakfast, order the eggs however you want, and like grab a coffee and talk to them and say, I want you to be the one to make this decision. I took my kids for dim sum. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Food is love. So what are the thing, uh, one other thing you said when you wrote the book, you talked about, you know, you did this for you, your, mm -hmm. where you were getting to and what you were trying to figure out. Has it helped? <laughs> it has. Is the gray less gray or is the gray smaller? Um, it has helped me be a better doctor for sure. Mm. Um, people have said at the end of the book, they've said, I got to the end of the book and then you didn't tell me the answer. Um, there, it's because it's not there, but um, it's not there for, like, I, there's no one answer, right? The answer is about you and your family and the moment because the moment is always different. It depends on the disease, it depends on the hospital, it depends on what the surgeon thinks of the CT scan or what the intensivist thinks the chance of a medicine working are. It's C and it's not black and white. But the answer 
is in elucidating what someone would find acceptable so that you know whether to roll the dice or not. And as a physician, I have to think less about adenosine triphosphate and not say, I can preserve adenosine triphosphate levels and use that as some sort of marker of success. Because what we say to patients is, oh, I can do this. And what in our heads we're saying is, oh, I can make an incremental increase in their blood pressure. But patients hear, oh, they're going to be OK. And no, they're not. <laughs> and I've heard, I've heard colleagues say things like, oh, their lactate went from 12 to 9, or their white count went from 26 to 24. And families go, terrific. And I go, what? <laughs> That's within the margin of error. Like, that, it doesn't mean anything. And so one of the things I talk about in the book is micro-improvements and how micro-improvements are clung to. Because we're all looking for hope. And so we hang on to the micro-improvement, which is delusional. It has nothing to do with the overall prognosis or state of the body. Um, and so uh, I, I'm cautious of micro-improvements, having written this book. I'm cautious of what I think of success. And I'm, I'm more um, adamant about understanding what patients think of success. But I don't think I'm any more successful than my colleagues at navigating this. Mm -hmm. I screw up these conversations all the time. I have families sort of try to fire me and say, we want a different doctor. We don't like that one. That doctor doesn't help my mom or whatever. And mm -hmm. I get, you know, my chief calls, and, you know, I got, all, I got an email. I'm like, I, I think I know who it's from. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I think you do. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I'll lighten up, you know, it's, um, it's difficult. It's not easy work. Um, but the book has certainly brought me to a better place than I was in before. Great. Well, we look forward, I think, to the, the next book, if, if there's another <laughs> way. Pina, are we, I think we're, yes, we're out, of town. out of town. We yeah. look forward to some signed copies in the lobby. I'd be happy to. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was great.